something about you guys, and this is the first step, something about you becomes attracted to Socrates. Socrates is not talking about milk. He's not talking about passions of the iron or the body. He's not talking about passions of the intellect. He's not talking about passions of the heart. Obligations and responsibilities. He's talking about something that you and I have a dim or a faint awareness of. It's what we call essence. Let's say if the iron, bronze, and silver speak to your body, Socrates speaks to your soul. Okay? And whatever your soul desires goes against whatever your body desires. So Socrates is a man who is against life. And yet for some strange reason, you're attracted to him. The first thing you need to understand in, re in regards to love. <clears throat> I don't know how attraction comes about. Lena, I don't know how attraction comes about. It's a mysterious thing, okay? It just happens, okay? You may be going out with someone. You're just friends. You're quite indifferent to them. But all of a sudden, one morning after like four or five months, you wake up and you say, oh my God, I think I really like her or him. Okay? Now, it begins with attraction. You're not yet in love, but you're attracted. Now, here's the thing you need to understand. Most often, you and I become attracted to someone's physical appearance, how they look, how they sound. Socrates becomes a symbol for a human being who physically is extremely unattractive. And yet despite this exterior that is ugly, there is something profoundly beautiful about his interior. So when you are walking around, you have friends who are 20, 25, 30, and you guys are talking about interesting things. They're interesting. Socrates is old. He's got a long beard. He hasn't showered. He smells bad. He looks bad. Everything about this man is bad. But when he opens his mouth, okay, there is something very, very profoundly beautiful about him, and you don't know what it is. And yet you find yourself slowly gravitating towards him. That's the first thing you need to have, attraction. Now, if Socrates is paying you attention, it means that when he looks at you and he sees that you're paying attention, he says, ah, I threw a bait out there. Julian and Charles and Lena are attracted. They have taken the bait. <clears throat> now, what happens when anybody falls in victim to a bait? Have you seen a fish? They wiggle. Why? They want freedom. You're not there yet. Attraction is a tiny little seed. How do things grow? You give them water. You give them light. You care for them. You make sure weeds don't grow around it. Remember, iron, bronze, and silver, though they are important in life, if you want wisdom, they become weed. They will suffocate your attraction to wisdom. It will die. Since Socrates has created or inserted this seed of attraction inside you, he needs to come down here. And protect it. Now you may think of him as kind, nice, compassionate. It's not the, it's not the case. Right? <clears throat> Once the seed of attraction grows, you go to the next step. It's called becoming curious. 
Remember some weeks ago we talked about the seven stages of love in the Greek world? What you have is ludos. It means to flirt. You are flirting with Socrates as well as Socrates flirting with you. Socrates is like a shop. He has a merchandise called wisdom. You are not yet a customer. You are right now a window shopper. You look, but there is no commitment in buying. You ask, but there is no commitment in wanting. Okay? Now, usually what happens when you become attracted to something and you become curious about something, even though Socrates has inspired that, you will find yourself going to Berkeley Library, checking out books and figuring out what books you can find that will kind of nourish you in your quest towards wisdom. And I think you need to go back to what Bruce Lee said. Boards don't hit back. Books are good, but they're not alive. You need a living, quacking human being who houses wisdom within, okay? <clears throat> now, how do you make attraction grow into curiosity? Time. The more time you spend with Socrates, the more of Socrates that you can house within. If you don't spend time with Socrates, you're not going to hear him. He's not going to be able to live inside you. Remember, attraction has about a two-minute lifespan. Curiosity, it may have an hour lifespan. Socrates is not a prostitute. <coughs> he doesn't want you to spend two minutes with him or an hour with him and then go your way. That's not the way he works. He wants to be immortal inside you. <coughs> now, when Socrates protects curiosity, and the way he does it is by asking you, to have coffee with him, to have tea with him, to have dinner with him, to walk with him. <clears throat> and as you spend more time with Socrates, your attachment to Socrates grows. You know what attachment means, right? It means dependency. Dependency is the opposite of freedom. It's the opposite of individualism. <clears throat> it means that when you become dependent on someone, they own a certain part of you. That without them, that part that lives inside you slowly decays and withers away. If you have fallen in love ever, what you find is that it begins with a look, then it, begin, then it goes to a hi, then a how are you, then a lunch, a dinner, a coffee, then perhaps you sleep with them. And then one morning you wake up and you say, I love you. Okay? Which means that I want to spend 16 of the 24 hours of the day with you. That's a good chunk of you and your time and your soul living inside another human being. And when they are not there, it's, you feel as if you're incomplete. You're like this chicken with no head, just running around wildly, aimlessly. Okay? Now, when Socrates creates the, a good amount of attachment, okay, he makes in, or inserts inside you this thing called interest. Now, here's the thing. You may assume that you're interested 
in wisdom, but that's not the case. You're only interested in Socrates and his expression of wisdom. This is a very, very dangerous place. Why? <clears throat> if all of a sudden, wisdom, which is everywhere, right, is condensed or only housed in a man named Socrates, it means that no one in the world of iron, no one in the world of bronze or silver, can nourish you in the way of wisdom. It's only Socrates and no one else. Imagine how many books in philosophy and religion and occult exist in by Berkeley Library. When you find someone like Socrates and you're interested in him and what he says, the entire Berkeley Library becomes useless for you. Okay, now, up to this point, the more you become interested in wisdom, the less you become interested or invested in iron, bronze, and silver. There is a great amount of conflict. <clears throat> As your desire for wisdom grows, your desire and want for iron, bronze, and silver decreases. Remember the story of the salmon fish I shared with you some time ago? If you were to go to YouTube, for example, and in its search engine just typed infants or happy infants, their needs are simple. Their laughter and their cries are profoundly innocent. There is nothing psychological about it. In other words, you don't have to sit back and say, are they crying because they lost a mother or a father? They're profoundly healthy, okay? Everything that they do is profoundly pure, innocent, unvarnished, uncontaminated. Then what happens? Then you have the influence of the parents. Then you have the influence of media, cell phones. Then you have the influence of school. Then you have social components such as fear, ambitions, hopes, dreams, and little by little, this kid becomes contaminated. And they laugh, but it's no longer innocent. They cry, but it's no longer innocent. They are filled with wants and needs, all socially manufactured and constructed. The point I'm trying to make is this. Socrates brings out of us those few months of infancy where everything about us was uncontaminated. But those uncontaminated parts, they have to fight against the social structures and social desires of the iron. Some of it is biological, okay? But for the most part, the manufactures of iron, bronze, and silver. There is a good chance that the conflicts could become so intense that you look at Socrates and say, listen, I have a midterm tomorrow, so I can't make it to class today. My wife says A, B, C, D, so I can't really make it today. My kid. <clears throat> and little by little, your excuses grow, which means that the internal dialogue or conflict create obstacles, and your move towards wisdom, they get shut down, and you go back to this. And even when you go back to your ordinary world, you're still going to have memories of Socrates. So there's going to be a good amount of conflict. But if you give it time, you will forget Socrates. 
like anything else in life. Experiences, if you don't protect them, if you don't nourish them, it will dim in quality and intensity. It's something you can lifelessly write about 10 years from now. Right? Now, <clears throat> Socrates knows really, really well the force of life. So you know what he does? He manipulates you even more. He says, let's go on a trip. There's a group of us. And you ask, how long is this trip? About three weeks. You got nothing to do. You go. And you spend more time with Socrates. You're going to be emotionally connected to Socrates, attached to Socrates. Now it's no longer about interest. Infatuation. You're not yet in love, but you're certainly infatuated. Okay? Now remember, if this is, for example, Charles, if Socrates only occupied 5% at the initial meeting, when you get to the point of <clears throat> curiosity, it becomes 10%. You have 10% of Socrates and 90% of life inside you. As it moves into the place of interest, now he occupies 25%. In other words, it's not going to be very difficult for you to go back to life and just push Socrates into trash. The moment you move into infatuation, Socrates now has about 70% of you and you have 30% of life. The 70% of Socrates now sits on top of your life and begins to slowly suffocate it. You know how when you feel as if you're falling for someone, you stop thinking about other people, you stop having fun around other people, you stop enjoying conversation with other people, you just want to have conversation, hang out with that one person, this is what happens when you get caught by Socrates. <clears throat> but you see, Socrates, as we said, he, like all good teachers, he is jealous. He doesn't want any competition. You still have 30% of life inside you. He says, I want to get rid of all of this. He spends more time with you. And he, if this is fire... He puts more flame, more and more fuel on this flame. Infatuation turns into obsession. Now, Socrates has 99.9% .9 presence inside you. This is important. Okay? Remember, it's not Socrates' wisdom. Now you're attached to Socrates. Socrates is your son. He keeps you warm. When he's not there, you are frozen. When he's there, you ask questions. When he's not there, you don't ask questions. He makes your entire life either meaningful or meaningless. Now, in the Greek world, when you get to the place of obsession, and obsession means the following. It is like your shadow following you. It doesn't matter where you go. Your shadow is there. Socrates is now your shadow. Wherever you go, he's there. And you no longer ask, what would Jesus do? You will ask, what would Socrates do? When you get to the place of obsession, the Greeks call this... Mania. Mania for maniac. Mania for crazy. It's not like you're going to go out there and shoot people. No. On the inside. On the inside. You are restless. You are homeless. And Socrates is the only home that you have. 
and without him, it's like you're going nuts. <clears throat> okay? Remember, all of this began with Ludos. You were just being flirtatious. Not with someone's body, but with someone's mind. You say, so Socrates, who was your teacher? Diotima. Well, who was it? It was a she. You learned from a woman? Yes. What did she teach you? Nothing except one thing. What is that one thing? The art of love. It began with a simple question. Now it's become this gigantic tree with all these branches. And every two seconds you ask a different question. Do you know what happens when you keep asking Socrates questions? Your brain gets to rewire itself. Now you only ask specific questions about specific things. And when Socrates isn't there, you don't know what kind of questions to ask from people down here in the iron, bronze, or silver. They don't understand you. Now remember, the closer you get to Socrates, the less other people can nourish you, which means what? You're going to feel lonely and isolated. You're going to feel confused. You're going to get depressed. And he is your only shade. Okay? Now, now that you have fallen into the trap of mania, that you only want Socrates, and without Socrates, your life amounts to nothing, something very interesting happens. You fall into the first stage of love. We call that Eros. Now, most people, of course, consider this to be sexual, physical, and it may be, there is nothing wrong with that, but <clears throat> think of Eros in the world of philosophy in this particular way. Socrates has a body. That body lives in a house. Okay? When Socrates speaks, he uses language. Language houses his intellect and his emotions. They are physical stuff. You can hear with your physical body. The first stage of love is Eros. You want to be physically next to Socrates. You want your ears to be touched by the spoken words of Socrates. And the thing you need to understand, you know, if the sun comes out today, sit in your room or somewhere in the backyard, Just allow the sun to hit your face and you will feel the warmth. The sun doesn't need to come down, but you feel its warmth. Socrates' physical presence, it puts you in a fear mode. It puts you in a trembling mode. Something about his physical presence makes you feel nervous. You know, it's like when you really, really like someone, but you don't know if they like you or not, okay? When you approach them, you're very nervous. What should you say? How should you say it? And you pray. I mean, you practice. And then you want to say, hi, how are you doing? But it just everything goes the wrong way. You begin to mumble, okay? And then you laugh because you're nervous, you say, I'm sorry, I, I'm probably sounding like a fool. You say all those things. Why? Their physical presence makes you feel nervous. Okay? And that's the first part of Eros. Now,
See, up to this point, things have been very, very easy for you. As long as you just can physically hang out with Socrates, you're satisfied. See, you are satisfied. Socrates is not there to sell his body. And Socrates is not there to simply speak for you to hear. It doesn't work that way. Socrates has bigger agendas. He wants to make sure you understand his ideas. Now, one of the things about love in the form of eros is the following. If Socrates asks you to come to the house at 7 o'clock, you'll be there at 7. If Socrates says, can you bring me a six-pack of Coke, you will bring it. If Socrates says, can you give me a ride to San Jose, you will do it. In love, there is always going to be submission. Submission. And submission means the following. Someone else has power over you. And you are more than willing to give up your own power so that you could do their will. In other words, if you love your mom and you've seen how hard she works or she has worked today, when you go home and like you have a math homework to do or you want to play video games and your mom says, I don't have milk, can you go out there and get milk? Because of your love for your mom, you are more than willing to sacrifice your own desires, get in the car or the bus or the taxi or your bike, go to Safeway, grab milk and bring it home. Okay? Now here's the thing you need to know. In the first stage of Eros, you will only submit and surrender your body and your time. What you haven't yet given up that you don't know, you still have a good amount of assumptions. It's easy to give up one's body. But to give up one's mind and heart or emotions is very, very difficult. Why? And to some extent, Eros does that for all of us. In other words, it kind of got like, like a vacuum, you kind know, of goes inside and sucks out all the beliefs and all the emotions, all the angers, all the hatred out of us. And we're good for about two, three, four, five weeks. But everything again comes back. Okay. There comes this place in love in the Greeks that kind of grows. It becomes different. It's called philia. It's a different kind of love. For the first time, you understand something, Julian. And what you understand is this. Socrates has something. Not only are you in love with Socrates, you're also in love with this unknown, mysterious merchandise that Socrates has. You are willing to sacrifice and submit your body to him. You go to his house every day. Hmm? You take him to places every day. You buy him things every day. But now you realize that Socrates is making bigger demands. He looks at you and says, Julian, do you understand? He has your body, Julian. Now he wants your mind. Philia. Now, this is a more evolved aspect of love. At this stage, he no longer cares about you just coming to the meetings and sitting there. What's the use? You know, relationships over time, what usually happens in relationships, you're in the same environment, same space as your wife or husband or your kids. But there is no longer a relationship. Socrates says, I know you're there physically. I want your mind to be present. I need you to understand what I'm talking about. Now, what needs to happen at this stage, you need to submit your mind and you need to submit your heart. You have given him your body, time. Patience, sacrifice, okay? Now he wants these. 
and you try to understand with your mind, you can't. So your mind is suspended for a time being. All you know is that you feel deeply. This, in the Greek, is called pragma. Now Socrates has deep roots inside you. There are moments where you want to laugh. You don't understand why. There are moments you want to cry. You don't understand why. There are moments you want to talk. There are moments you want to be quiet. It's like you sitting naked underneath the sun and just basking in it. Socrates, like the sun, gives you warmth. You don't understand it. And you have to be okay with that. Now, it's going to be for many, 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 many years, you're going to allow Socrates abusing your body and abusing your, your mind. All you know is that whenever you're around him, you feel intensely about everything. Now, here's the thing. Socrates is a married man with five kids some 3,000 years ago. There comes a point he looks at it and says, Julian, you need to go home now. You say, okay, do you know what happens when you move further and further away from the sun? You get really, really cold. You go to these people, your friends, who say, Julian, let's go hang out. You say, no, you guys are making me cold. You go to school. Let's say you want to do philosophy. You say, you know, Amir, you're not really a good instructor. Philosophy usually gives you warmth, confusion, curiosities, obsession, infatuation. It makes me, usually makes me focus when I'm with Socrates. You don't do any of that. In fact, you're just a great distractor. And you go to your companion, to your parents, and you realize none of these people are doing it for you. You are in life, but you have no attachment to any of these areas. The iron bronze and silver. You see, Socrates is not going to house you 24-7. So there are going to be moments where you have to walk home. And when you walk home, you walk home alone. And when you're home, you're home alone, despite all these people being around you. Okay? What time are we done? Is that now? What time is it right now? Ten, nine or ten? Oh. Okay, let me just say the last part and then we'll go home. There is this last aspect of love where Socrates has played enough with your body, has played enough with your emotions. You have a good amount of data, Julian. You have a good amount of information. Okay. You could even say you have a good amount of knowledge about what Socrates is talking about. What you lack. Experience. There comes a point in your spiritual evolution where you say, I love Socrates. I love what Socrates has inside him. But I am looking for Sophia to come down and touch me. And this is a great place to be. Why? Because if you are a good student, there needs to come a time where you walk away from Socrates as his, and his wisdom. You understand what he's saying, but now you're looking for an experience. An experience means the data and the information and the knowledge. They are touched by Sophia, they descend inside you, and they come to life. Now you have wisdom. And this is called agape. You have universal knowledge. You have wisdom inside you. So your name from that point on is no longer Julian. Your name is Sophia. Now, you will only reveal your true name, Sophia, 
when you're around people who are seeking Sophia. When you're with your friends who are in the iron stage, your name is Julian. When you are at work making money, your name is Julian. When you are with your parents or wife or husband or children, your name is Julian. Only when you are seekers, after, when you're with seekers after wisdom or truth, does your name from Julian change to Sophia. And you don't say that. Other people attach the name Sophia unto you. So, <clears throat> remember, everything starts with attraction. And we didn't really talk about the fact that there comes a point where you will need Socrates, no longer want him, need him. And that's an emotional relationship. And if you don't have the need, you're not going to get there. Wisdom is never going to come to you. And no one can do this on their own. It's impossible. It's like anything else. You need milk, you go to Safeway. You need wisdom, find a shop like Socrates. Inside him lives wisdom. And go see how much it costs. And the more uh, mature a teacher, the more expensive he or she will share their gifts with you. Have a nice day. I will see you Wednesday.